Morning, everybody. How are you doing? Awesome. So, my name's Arthur Doler, or Art, take your pick. Uh, I'm here today talking about stuff. This is the obligatory social media stuff, so let's see. But here's the gist of what I'm talking about. Well, that's me, for starters. You guys get to deal with my bespoke artisanal hand-drawn slides, because that's what I do now. Uh, because it didn't take enough time to develop presentations. But why I'm here today is I want you, all of you, to do public speaking. Which raises a pretty, you know, sensible question. Why in the hell would I do that? Why would I get up in front of a bunch of strangers that I don't know, or even worse, coworkers who I do know, who are going to mock me on Monday, and put myself out there? Well, I'm really glad you asked, because I you know, care enough about this that I made a 30-minute presentation about it. So, <laughs> Reason number one for public speaking, right, is that you just have a complete load of money that you just need to get rid of somehow. Because speaking in public is probably one of the fastest ways to burn through that if you have to go travel for conferences, stuff like that. Uh, and obviously that's a joke, right? If you do have a bunch of spare cash, hire me. I do, you know, come give talks at companies for things, but um, shameless plug aside, the actual reason, the actual primary reason that I give talks in public is learning. Now, you might think that sounds a little nonsensical. Why would you know, giving a talk, teaching people, help me learn things? Well, there's two reasons. One is that it's a forcing function. I know speakers who sign up, and they put in an abstract, and they know nothing about the topic they're trying to actually put in. They learn just enough to be able to write a credible abstract. And then when they get accepted, if they get accepted, they now have to deliver a credible presentation. So it forces them to go out and learn the topic. That's a great way to force yourself to learn something, because that kind of pressure really helps for some people. If it doesn't help for you, don't do it that way. But another way is I learn more when I'm giving talks, because I have to know a lot more about the topic. I have to understand the context. I have to understand the details, not because I'm terrified that one of you might ask me a question that I can't answer, although that's actually also true. It's because I have to know enough to thread something credibly, to build a story, a narrative that you can come along with, that I can explain to each of you, that I can say, okay, come along with me on this journey and we're gonna teach you some stuff. I have to build a suspension, a, a support structure for that. And that requires me digging way deeper into a topic than I ever would have before. Reason number two is something that I've heard called the, the hallway track. Now, conferences often have tracks, like Barcamp here today has four different ones. So, uh, usually there's something like an agile track or a manager track or a you know, people person track, that kind of stuff, or the JavaScript or Ruby or whatever, depending on the conference. But what we call the hallway track is the conversations that happen outside of any actual presentation. The conversations you have in the hallway with attendees, with speakers, with other organizers, with recruiters, with people who are working the booths. I've had some fascinating conversations. I get ideas from those things that I never would have before. Because I'm working and I'm discussing these things with people who are, they care enough to show up at a conference and learn about something. And they were probably at one of my talks, if they're coming up to me and starting a conversation. And so they have an opinion. They have thoughts and concepts and things that I have not experienced before. The odds are really high. And it's always useful to get those outside perspectives to help give you more information, more context on a particular topic. And everybody keeps looking down at this. I'm going to trip completely on this at some point. So, Reason number three is that the other speakers that I've met really rock. I have met some amazing people through speaking. And I'm not just talking about like people like Corey House and David Neal and other you know, people that you don't know because there's regional speakers, but I've met people who are very, very giving, who are very, very intelligent. They care a lot. Think about it. These people overcame whatever innate, intrinsic uh, 
introversion they have, whatever problems they have with anxiety, the natural problem, you know, the anxiety involved in getting up in the front of a bunch of people, the effort involved in actually creating an abstract, developing it, writing the talk, probably practicing, you hope they've practiced, that's a lot of effort. And all of these people have put that effort in because they care a lot about the topic they're talking about. And that makes them really interesting to talk to because they care. They care about learning. They care about sharing that knowledge. And they care about trying to build these discussions. Reason number four is networking, the people kind of networking. So all of the technology people can get, you know, stop being excited. I mentioned recruiters. There were a lot of recruiters at technical events, usually. People working the booths, sponsors for the event get a booth, typically. And that means they send somebody who's there either looking to drum up business or to recruit new developers, new creatives, new whoever the hell they're courting in that particular conference. Those people also go to a lot of different conferences. They see a lot of different things. Sometimes they get to go to the talks. They're really interesting to talk to, too. And beyond just the sheer nature of meeting people, like if I wanted to move to Kansas City, I know three different recruiters who would call up you know, the top of a drop of a hat. But the other half is as you speak, as you develop kind of these artifacts from speaking, things like videos, which I'm lucky enough to be having done today, things like you know, my slides that are usually posted on SlideShare after my talk, et cetera, these things become advertisement for your personal brand. There, that qualifies me to be in the creative track. <laughs> but realistically, it mean, it's true. These are things that you're creating, that you're developing, that tell people what you care about, the things you know about. I know people who have gotten jobs based entirely on presentations that they've given. And reason number five, the last one, the best one, endless adoration from everyone, all the time. <laughs> Which, of course, that's not true. What it actually is, uh, it's regular exercise for your amygdala. If you're not familiar with your brain, the structure of the brain, the amygdala is one of the core systems involved in anxiety and fear. And public speaking is a great way to give that a workout, let me tell you. <laughs> so those are some of the reasons. Those are five of the really good reasons why you should be doing that. But why should you listen to me about it? This is back into shameless plug territory. No. Typically, in presentations, you have to establish credibility. And I'm, this is what I've got for credibility. I've given 22 sessions at 12 different conferences over a year and change at this point. Um, my batting average this year is actually 690 for acceptances versus rejections, which is unreal to me. I don't know who I have dirt on, but I clearly do on somebody. That was lucky. <laughs> I've also got diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, which, OK, that's a thing. A lot of people are. But I actually overcome that every time I go and give a speech in public, because I'm actually kind of addicted to it. It's not just because of the chemical hits, you know, the dopamine and the serotonin, et cetera, what my brain gets flooded with when it's like, what are you doing? It's, I have conversations with people. It's that hallway track. It's meeting other speakers. It's getting up in front of people and convincing them that what I'm talking about is a good idea. That's really, really cool to me. And it's really cool to see people who grasp and go, oh, that's, I understand. I get where you're coming from. And now I'm going to take that and do something with it. That's really cool to me. Grab the mouse awkwardly. But what if you make a mistake? Right? That's a big concern. And the thing is, it's a dumb thought. That's not a really good thought. Because what happens is you have people like you who've picked a talk to come to. And you don't want to be wrong about that. Because for starters, it's really awkward to get up and leave a talk. I've done it. It sends a really strong message to the speaker. But it is kind of awkward, especially if you're in the front row. Everybody in the front row is basically trapped. <laughs> and so the thing to remember is that these people wanted to be here. They want you to succeed. They want to be right that they picked your session. 
And so they are on your side. And their brains are actually on your side too. They, the audience, you guys, will forget mistakes that I make if I don't call them out. If I fumble on a word and just recover. If I do things like accidentally drop water on my laptop. You probably wouldn't have remembered that if I hadn't called it out. If it had landed on the laptop, that would have been different. But the point is, is that you will forget mistakes that speakers make. The audience wants you to succeed. And what they'll remember is the message, the feelings that you gave them during that talk, not what actually happened during it. So let's assume that I've convinced you, because my rhetoric is completely sound and awesome. Where do you actually start? Well, I'm going to talk about you know, my origin story, my life story. This is not the only way to do it, but this is a way that I've seen a lot of speakers kind of build up. And I kind of accidentally fell into the pattern. The first way is start going to conferences. Start attending. Go to these places. Listen. Listen for what people aren't saying. Find the things that you wish people would say. I started attending conferences when I took the job that I'm in now. And they have a bunch, typically, of 101 talks, intro-level talks for various technologies, et cetera. And I was desperate for some 201 talks, desperate for something a little higher level. Nobody was presenting them. So I'm like, OK, that's a thing I'll do. Great. I'll be a speaker. How hard could that be? And so I started giving lightning talks at work. If you're not familiar with a lightning talk, a lightning talk is a 10 to 15 minute talk on a single topic. They're usually very fast, very impromptu, very like thrown together. And can you actually see that? You can't see the lightning bugs. I was worried about that. Um, I started giving lightning talks every time they came around at work, which we used to do every week. And then, then they changed it to every other week, and I still signed up. And as they did that, as I did these talks, I had to come up with content. I had to come up with things I wanted to talk about. And it turned out to be a fantastic way to discover what I cared about what I actually cared enough about to go speak in front of a bunch of people. Because I started with data science stuff, and that was cool. But then I got, you know, I ran out of stuff about data science to talk about, and I started talking about psychological concepts, talking about cognitive biases, talking about things like flow or meditation. And I found that that's the stuff I really, really enjoy. Like, I love telling people about that and kind of watching people connect dots and go, oh, that's something I can use. So armed with that, the next step was actually bar camp. Uh, I talked first in front of a bunch of people that I did not know at bar camp two years ago. Uh, yes, woo for bar camp, right? <laughs> bar camp or a local user group or something along those lines are a great first step because the audience has less invested in it. I mean, you paid bar camp's attendee fee to be here, which is not high as opposed to paying several hundred dollars to go to an actual technical conference. Like, you're less invested in the game. But more importantly, bar camp's great because it's all a bunch of people who are just signing up ad hoc. People who are just like, I'm going to do this presentation. I didn't know I was going to do it until noon today, and now I'm giving it at 3. So I don't want to say the quality is a little lower, but <laughs> the presentations aren't as polished as you would expect from a bunch of people who've submitted abstracts and had those abstracts accepted and then gone on to actually produce an hour-long presentation. So that. No, that was awkward. That and user groups are great places to start giving these talks, to start getting up in front of strangers and talking about particular things. And then I started you know, submitting to conferences. And what do you know, they accepted me. So now I'm a conference speaker, which was terrifying, still is terrifying in a lot of ways. Hold on. Please shut up. Because if that keeps doing that, I'm going to be more distracted than you. Yeah, two, 22 talks at 12 conferences, and I can't remember to turn my phone on silent. <laughs> but once I started speaking at conferences, I was basically hooked. Once I had people coming up after talks and going, that was really cool. I learned something. I'm going to do something with that at my work, at my home. That was like, that's the drug that I kind of crave. And then step five is profit. It's not profit. It's never profit. 
It does take a, a lot of effort and time to be a conference speaker. Um, a lot of conferences are small and do not have the money to pay travel. A lot of them will cover the hotel, which is really great. But you're probably going to be paying your own time and your own travel to get there. That said, there are a number of different conferences regionally that are freaking amazing. You have uh, Lincoln, or Nebraska Code in Lincoln. You've got Kans or Kansas City Developer Conference in Kansas City. I think I'm pointing south. You have Prairie Code, which is coming up in Des Moines, September 27th and 28th, which I'm speaking at, so go buy tickets. Um, there are regional, local conferences that you can start speaking at without too much cost to you. And those are great places to kind of get started. And if you think that you don't have anything to talk about, you're actually very wrong. This is something that I've kind of grappled with myself in that you have to, you have to overcome this thing where you think that everybody knows everything you do. And that everything you know is so completely obvious. That's not true. It's actually a cognitive bias called the curse of knowledge. And you can't envision what it's like to not know the things you know. Your brain basically has no undo function. And so what's important in speaking isn't necessarily that you're on the forefront of whatever framework you're working with or you know, whatever the latest version of Adobe XDDL, whatever. I don't know. I don't do that. Sorry. But that was the flowers are awakening. Um, <laughs> What's important is that you're out there telling people who don't know the things you know about those things, that you're passing information on to people who are behind you, that you're pulling people forward because you're looking to people who are ahead of you to pull you forward. And so there need to be people where you're at pulling other people forward, training that next generation of people who will train the next generation. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm telling you to go speak in public, because we need to be pulling people forward. We need to help the people who are behind us. And this is part of my giving back to Barcamp, who has been very accepting, to conferences that have been more than willing to have me come and speak. My, part of me giving back is trying to get people in the game, trying to pull people in and say, you too can be a public speaker. You too can make an idiot of yourself up in front of a whole bunch of people. Yeah, woohoo. <laughs> so with that said, what makes a good talk? Let's go through some of the basic stuff, because some things I've learned in this process. Well, while you're giving a talk, there are two stories, more or less, that I've discovered are the core of any good talk. It's either one or the other. It's either I had a problem and here's how I solved it. Or it's I'm going to tell you why you should consider using this tool or framework or whatever it is. So if you're paying attention, this talk falls in the latter of those camps. I'm trying to sell you on the story of why you should speak in public. But before you actually write the talk, you typically have to write the abstract. I've done it the other way around. but. Writing a talk's a lot of work. So speakers will often submit the abstract to conferences and go, I, I'll write it if somebody accepts it. Again, you get that deadline thing. It plays hell with my anxiety, but the other way is a lot of work. So what makes a good abstract? A good abstract tells you what problem you are solving in the person's life, that story that you're trying to sell them. And it also says what an attendee should walk away knowing what you'll come away from the talk with. So this one I wanted to include because it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot. We'll talk about how to build abstracts. And actually, there's one thing I should mention on that. Um, I work with a bunch of people who have also done conference speaking. I'm really lucky to do that. We help each other review abstracts and things like that. Getting a group that can help you do that is really cool because they don't know what's in your head. And so we built up a series of four questions, actually, to ask each other. One, who do you think this talk is for? Two, what problem or thing or you think they're act this talk is actually solving? Three, what's the main takeaway from that talk? And four, what can you, what's one thing you can do with coming home from that talk immediately? We ask those four questions, basically. So I'll post an abstract, and people, without asking me other questions, will answer those four questions based on the abstract alone. 
And so that lets us go, okay, if somebody is just looking at my talk in you know, the program of a conference, what are they going to think about it? It helps you get that outside perspective so you understand how to get people who actually want to be there. Because there isn't really anything more awkward than getting a whole bunch of people who don't know anything about Git in your Git 201 talk. Because they're all lost. Actually, that's a side note. If you are at a conference ever and the talk is just either above your level or below your level, it's okay to get up and leave. Like, you don't have to feel trapped, except the front row. Like I said, you are stuck here. <laughs> if you are going to get more out of some other talk, I would really rather, as a speaker, I would rather you go find somewhere else to be. Because if you're just going to sit there and be angry about it, then you're sending off kind of negative vibes, and I'm looking at you, and you're frowning, and I'm like, why are you frowning? Do you not understand? Like, it gets really, like, especially in my head, I'll start running down things like, what am I doing wrong? And all you're at about is you just wanted a different talk. So go find that talk, please. So back to selecting. First thing you can do is persist. Try really hard to do things. I, like I said, my batting average is f stupidly high this year. That's not something you see from other speakers. And I, I don't know why. I'm assuming it's a fluke. It's probably a fluke. You will probably have to submit to a number of places before you get accepted places. That's just the way things work. KCDC this year had 800 submissions for 100 and I think it was 120. They actually added rooms, 120 talks. That's, they had to say no to seven out of every eight people. You're going to get said no to a lot. That's just how it works. Another thing you can do is try and differentiate your talks. Whether that's by speaking on something people aren't speaking about, or by taking a different tack on the talk, or by making sure that your talk is interesting or funny, etc. The third thing you can do is try and network with people. If you're at conferences, talk to speakers. Ask them, ask them questions. Because a lot of people who are speaking at conferences, especially in the kind of the Midwest circuit, are also organizing other conferences. And if you can get your name and face in front of a conference organizer, and you can convince them that you have any kind of modicum of idea of what you're doing, they'd be way more likely to take a risk on you, a chance on you, and accepting your talk. Lastly, try and document stuff that you do. If you do give talks places and it gets recorded, post it online. Put your slides up on SlideShare. Build artifacts from your actual speaking and try and get that out there. Because if you can add those to your submissions, then people are going to have a better idea of what you actually talk about and how you talk and if you know what you're talking about. It helps you become more than just an abstract and a, a title and an abstract. And lastly, persist. Again, persist. If you get told, no, wait until after the conference, for starters, but then come back and email the organizers and say, hey, I was interested. What didn't you like about my abstract? What could I do better? Is this conference just not for my type of talk? Am I doing something dumb in the abstract that you think is not, you know, you made, you, uh, made you your decision different? The first time I spoke at KCDC, which was not this year but last year, I did not get accepted initially. They said no, and I was like, oh, I'm sad. I was actually very sad about it. But I sent an email to Jonathan Mills, the organizer, saying, hey, what can I do better? What can I do differently with my abstracts? Can I just do different talks so you're not interested in the kind of soft skills talks I give? And Jonathan, being really nice, emailed me back and said, hey, no, your abstracts were OK. Just, you know, it's the vagaries of we didn't have enough space, et cetera. But then he had speakers drop on him. And he said, OK, now I have to go find new speakers. I'm going to start with the people who actually have demonstrated that they care about it. Wandered into the light. And those are the people, those people get noticed. That's a really good way, again, trying to keep and persist. My last tip is to always say thank you. If you do get accepted, if you do give a talk, always say thank you. Because without speakers, there wouldn't be a conference. That's true. 
And I've heard conference organizers say it a lot, and I like to hear it because it makes me feel nice. But if there weren't an audience, there wouldn't be speakers. I would just be up here talking to myself. And while that might make a fun comedy hour, it's not really very useful as a conference talk. So thank you for taking your time to come and listen to me tell you things. Thank you very much. If you guys have any questions, I'll be up here packing up, and then you can catch me out there.